Good morning, folks. Uh, I'm Martin Hannigan, and uh, I'm with a stealth mode startup in Keflavik, so I'm just going to identify myself as chairman of the board of the Internet Golf Society. I've got a lot of slides here, so I'm going to I'm going to try and fly through them relatively quickly. Um, I thought that the pretty pictures at the end would be more interesting. Um, I'm Martin. Uh, I'm currently uh, working on a project in Keflavik uh, where um, we recently finished the uh, deployment of multiple submarine cables. Uh, I have a background as a captain, a uh, merchant marine, uh, and I work in central office data center, network geekery, and uh, I have my recent sub-cable expertise is added here with some SS7 and transport. Um, if you'd like to connect with me on LinkedIn or Facebook, there's my email address, and if you have any questions that I might be able to answer for you related to submarine cables, um, my phone number's on the deck, and please feel free to give me a call anytime. So we're going to really quickly cover uh, a situation, uh, a situation report, a, a quick business case, uh, scope of the project, timeline, a summary, go over some interesting stuff, and take questions if we have time. So situation is this: uh, Iceland's surrounded by water. Obviously, uh, there's a low cap cable, uh, there's a high cap cable, uh, there's a history of backhaul aggression on the high cap cable backhaul elements. The high cap cable terminates uh, in Dunnet Bay and terrestrially backhauls down to London. Uh, the, low cable, the low cap cable is going to end a life soon. Cable lifetime is roughly 15 to 20 years. Um, obviously this access is unsuitable for a high cap uh, business or high cap business requirements and there's no good internet access anywhere as well. So this is the existing cable. This is called Fire Ice One. Uh, leaves the east coast of Iceland. Uh, it branches to the Faroe Islands. If you see this, uh, this connection here that kind of You'll see one, you know, you'll see the whole leg go down to Dunnet Bay and then you see a cut to these islands. What we do there is we use a branching unit. We drop a piece of steel or beryllium copper in the water with uh, all the electronic components and there's literally, it's, there's three turrets and out of one of those turrets we splice in another cable and we take it to another route. So the business case to fix the situation with the capacity. Um, you know, you have to look at the drivers. Uh, what's the problem? Well, our problem is that there's no redundancy and there's not enough capacity. Um, you have to look at security. The submarine cables actually contribute to national security because they allow, you to, they allow you to communicate with other nations and they allow access to the internet, media to flow. Um, there's political aspects of it. There's uh, freedom of information aspects. There's, you know, rights to access. Um, you have to you have to uh, analyze your performance. So obviously, you know, you've got distance limitations you, and you have expectations based on those distances. So there's speed of light calculations, for example. Um, you know, I think it's 0.75 milliseconds for 150 kilometers. Um, you run a cable 3,000 kilometers, you can do the math and figure out what the rough latency is. And finally, the return on investment. Are you expecting to get any return? Are you going to uh, sell light, are you going to sell wave pairs? Are you selling access? Um, and so on. So the parameters of the project were to look at the wet and dry plant. Um, you do a full due diligence. You go out and you meet the manufacturer. In this case, it's Tyco. Um, you look at the electronics. You look at the cable types. There's multiple cable types depending upon the depths and the and the, geog and the geology of the bottoms. Um, you look at the dry plant. What what electronic components are going to be in the landing stations? Um, it's fairly proprietary by vendor. So if you're going with Tyco, you're going to see obviously Tyco equipment in the landing station or Alcatel. You'll see Alcatel all the way from uh, the DC power plant to uh, all of the ad drop mucks. Um, you, need, you define the capacity and you do that by defining how many, how many pairs of fiber are going to be in a cable. Um, you, can, you can drop a cable with two pair of fiber, four or eight. The biggest cable that I'm, that I'm aware of is an eight pair cable. There's probably something bigger, I just don't know about it. Um, you, have to, you have to determine the routing, uh, you have to look at where it's going to go undersea and how you're going to backhaul it to get it to the rest of the world. Um, and then finally you need to determine what, ser what your service date is going to be. The risks, length, uh, too long may, may uh, introduce too much delay and may not be suitable for your purposes. Um, uh, it, it also may be just fine. Uh, the repeater distance and sparing, that contributes to future upgrades um, to, with op amps. Uh, the closer the, uh, the repeaters or the op amps, the more capacity that you're going to pump out and the, likely, the better likelihood that you'll be adaptable for a future upgrade. Just like we're discussing uh, 40 gig and 100 gig uh, cable operators are uh, doing the same thing and that's going to require uh, 
upgrades in the future. Um, you have to, two minutes? Okay, five minutes, okay. You have to uh, be aware of shipping. Uh, you obviously don't want your, your cables in a shipping lane if, if it's possible, but as we saw in the Middle East, that's really not possible because uh, all the cables run through the Strait of Hormuz, and uh, that's a pretty tight place to be. You have to be aware of fisheries. Um, you actually have to play pretty nice with fishermen. Fishermen have associations just like we do, um, and when you commission your uh, cable, you go and talk to the fishermen, and you sit down and you show them the routes that you think that you want to use, and then they identify what, where, where their fisheries are, and you negotiate a settlement so that you place a cable in places that they don't like the fish. Anchors and backhoes, uh, big, big problem, and probably uh, greater than 50% of uh, the cause of outages. What anchors do, um, you know, these submarine cables are hard targets. You don't just go bring your ship over one and drop an anchor on it and go, whoops. You, when, when a ship drops an anchor, they drop the anchor, they lay out some chain to add some weight to hold the ship in place, um, and then if the captain of that ship doesn't do the right thing, the ship starts dragging, the anchor catches onto the cable, the cable snaps under its own weight. It's fairly straightforward. It's basically the idiot factor. Uh, and then finally, permitting. To, to cross all these uh, international boundaries and things, you need, to, you need to apply for permits and get permission, and in some cases, you need to pay taxes. So the chronology of the project. You sign an intent to proceed. Uh, that basically gets the cable operator, in, uh, gets the engineering moving, gets the materials acquisition going. They commission the desktop study. The desktop study is the uh, analysis of the route that you're going to take. Uh, you're actually going to lay the cable. Uh, you complete the engineering, you acquire the real estate for the landing stations, and then you sign your final agreement. Once you sign your final agreement, you uh, make a, a fairly large down payment, and uh, the project begins. Um, you finish your backhaul selection, you do your ocean survey, and basically they send a ship out, and they, they map the topography of the, uh, of the route, and um, they uh, do that from the A through, all the way through to the Z end, and then do an analysis. Uh, Okay, so they manufacture the cable. Cable's manufactured in lengths, and uh, they typically will uh, join them, and uh, the joint technology is really the sweet spot of the cable. Think of this as really as just a wet Metro E, uh, and a really long one, and uh, it, it really is that simple. Um, so you finish your pops, you, you contract your backhaul, whether it's dark fiber IRU, or you buy a wave pairs from someone else, or waves. Uh, you ready your cross connects, you order all your equipment, you install it, complete your acceptance testing, and you're ready for service. So at the end of the project, we got a surprise, another cable. Well, great, so you, you, know, you add this into your system. Um, the more cables, the merrier. So we started out with, the, uh, started out with this, and uh, when all was said and done, in, in the time frame of about a year, we ended up with this. So now we've got uh, three routes out of the country, uh, two high cap two high, one high cap cable existing, one high cap uh, inbound, and a third high cap uh, cable to be installed as well. So interesting stuff. There's about 41 active underwater networks in the east and west coast of the states, 42 active in the UK and North Sea, about 36 in the Baltics and the Skagerrak, and I have no idea what the Skagerrak is, 75 active nets in the Med, the Red Sea, and the Black Sea, um, there's 50 active cable ships that do lay, repair, or both, um, and typically the vendors will uh, share their ships. So if Tyco has a ship in the area and it's on station laying a cable and there's a cut somewhere and, there, and Global Marine has a ship that's closer and idle, they'll contract Global Marine to go ahead and uh, fix that cable. Because of the jointing technology, they, they can do that. So in the, in the event of an outage, the Global Marine ship working on the Tyco system would go pick up a spool of cable, excuse me, put it on the ship, go to the cut, take the common jointing technology, cut the cable, pull up the ends, splice them together, throw it back down, and complete the repair. Um, cables are powered from the landing stations. Uh, there's a power station on each end at 48 volt DC. Um, cable costs are coming down quickly. The more capacity on the cable, the lower cost per mile as you utilize it. Tough to reverse the unit cost, but generally, the more denser, the cheaper. Um, okay, so. Interesting stuff. Here's a crossings map. So, you know, I've, I've been having discussions with some folks and said, do you know that, like, all your transport probably crosses each, crosses other transport multiple times? And they said, oh, no, there's just no way that that happens. Well, here's a map of most of the cables from the East Coast into London. That's pretty messy. Um, and to summarize, redundancy and proximity, tell the route should be considered a revenue opportunity, vendor experience, plant reliability, 
all that. It really does matter. Cables are expensive, but if you cut costs, you can really hurt yourself. And, and I think what we're seeing in some of these cable cuts are that people are cutting costs by doing things like not burying the cable in shallow depths and not using the proper armoring because you can tell the vendor not to armor things in the wrong places and they will do it and you will pay. Um, prefix mapping the subcables. We saw the Renesis presentation yesterday. That was fairly interesting, but it might even be more interesting to look at where which cables those prefixes are coming from. Sounds fairly ridiculous, but could help to solve some problems. Tell you, telegeography and cable operators are your friend. They'll tell you anything you want to know because they want you to know where their cables are so that you don't damage them. Um, I also have a, the latest telegeography map. If you want to see it, please let me know. And be wary of FUD. There's a lot. Of, there's a lot of misinformation out there which motivated me to give this talk. Um, fishing conflicts analysis, when we meet with the fishermen, uh, they gave us GPS coordinates of all of their, uh, their drags over a six month period. And so the cable was routed to the south of the fishery. Um, that made us happy and that made them happy because we didn't disrupt their fishing. Um, here's an, another example of routing. This is the leg that goes into the Faroe Islands. You'll notice these numbers here. These are depths, um, 21, 38 meters. All nautical charts are in meters. Um, pretty deep. A fishing net's not going to catch this, and you don't have to heavily armor it, so you can save a little money here. This is a uh, ocean floor bathymetry. What you're seeing here is a, a canyon, and these colors are uh, current current uh, analysis. You wouldn't want to put a cable in here because uh, if that if the wall of that 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 route collapses, it's going to break the cable. Also, if there's a high amount of current, it causes a condition called strum. The cable goes back and forth on the floor of the ocean and it basically rots and you go out of service. Also, you wouldn't want to run a cable across this and have it hanging because you might piss off a submarine captain. Uh, here's a landing station, I'm not kidding. <laughs> here's a landing station approach. Uh, it's very shallow, you would bury your cable all the way. And here's my credits, basically Tyco Marine, Far Ice Cable Operator, the government, uh, the International Cable Protection Committee, and my favorite search engine. And please let me know if you have any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Marty.